is I've just been really lucky that I, for pretty much my entire life, I've been able to just do the things that I found interesting and find a way to make a living doing them. And it never occurred to me to, I've never thought about getting a job or applying. I, I think I'm going to apply for a job just to see what it's like, because I've never done that. And then of course, I'm going to try and mess with the guy who's interviewing me because I don't need the job. So, right. um, so yeah, I've just been, it, it, for whatever reason, I mean, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My dad was a dentist. His father, actually, I don't even know what his dad did, but my mom was a consultant and started businesses. Her dad owned a jewelry shop. Um, her grandfather did something. So it was kind of, you know, in the DNA in a way, um, but it literally, it was never a conversation, never occurred to me. In fact, my father always wanted me to get a job. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpre's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today um, is going to be a doozy, and I think he, he knows that. Uh, he's, he's done a lot of things, so there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, he's a Masters All-American sprinter, uh, internationally known internet marker, former co-host of the internationally syndicated TV show Disc Doctors. We're definitely going to get into that here, so... Uh, stick stick for that part because that's going to be a highlight. And then also, uh, nowadays, he makes shoes, uh, founder of the company Zero Shoes. Welcome to the show, Stephen Sashin. Thank you. I, uh, I'm already a little anxious because clearly you've been stalking me. <laughs> well, I mean, that's my job, right? I, mean, I don't what, care if it's your well, job or not. It's freaking me out, man. Well, I, I, guess, um, I guess I should say it's just me doing manually. Uh, I'm not I'm not setting, you know, any kind of AI to track all of your movements or anything like that. So you, you could, the, the worry level could probably go down just okay. a little bit. All right. All right. If I, if I hear someone riding close behind me on my bike ride <laughs> home though, I'll know it's you. Uh, well, I will say, well, I don't know where you live particularly, yes, but that's, that's what you say. Well, that's what I say now. Um, yeah. Until I'm like, hi, Steven, how are you doing? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> You, you said we could go out for a ride sometime. <laughs> I'm your new best friend. <laughs> Tell me all about shoes. No, I, I uh, uh, was watching the clip from you guys on Shark Tank. And, you know, in the intro, they do the, you know, the personal profile or whatever. They call, and yeah, I, they call that the home package where they come to where you live and film things. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I think I saw uh, you running down the trail at Chautauqua State Park in the shoes there at the beginning. Yes. That is exactly where I was. Yes, uh, and I will say the reason I know that is in April of this year, my uh, now wife and I uh, came out to Boulder and got married, so we were out there. Yeah. That's why I'm familiar with the state park. <laughs> you didn't call me. You didn't invite me. I love cake. Yeah, well, well to be fair, um, you would have been the second celebrity that was there, uh, <laughs> so you would have crashed the show. Who was the first? The first was um, former Disney star uh, Johnny Tsunami, or his character is named Johnny Tsunami. Um, he lives in Boulder and does elopements now. So, oh. uh, yeah, that was a surprise to me as well. I didn't know him, but my wife did, so she was excited. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we didn't boy. know he was going to be uh, the officiant until the day of, and there he showed up. And Well, so Colorado is a state where anybody can marry you, so the officiant for my wife's and my wedding – was uh, the woman who was the, well, she was part of a marimba band that I played in. Okay. And I said, you know, you'd be the perfect person for this. And she said, sure. And she was the perfect person. We had a lot of fun. That's, <clears throat> did did the rest of the band show up and yes. play? 
Yes. Okay. So we did have a marimba band for our wedding, and most people had never seen or heard a marimba band. And marimba, African marimba music, is like the most danceable thing in the world. Right. So nobody was in their chair for hours. It, it, we had a <laughs> super fun time. We also we gave out little mini boxes of Lucky Charms that had mm. your name on it for you know where you were, what your food was, not where you're going to sit. We had board games on the tables instead of flowers in the middle. So mm. you picked where you wanted to sit based on the board game you want to play. And at some point, someone cracked open the those boxes of Lucky Charms. We had a food fight um didn't come out of nowhere one of our guests had was snuck in a thing of silly string and he would very surreptitiously squirt people from across the room and once they figured out it was him uh the food fight began and at the end lane and i stayed to help clean up uh with the staff and we said we're so embarrassed they said are you kidding this was so much fun we're happy to do this <laughs> <laughs> well, i mean it, it sounds like a great time um it was. It, we had we had a good time by ourselves unfortunately uh, COVID kind of made things difficult yeah. and the getting married front. So we decided to basically invite nobody. So sorry. That's why your invitation was not in the mail. Uh, uh even family sense. wasn't invited. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting time, but. Well, it, I'm glad people are here for the, how to plan a wedding podcast. And... Yes. <laughs> forget about, forget about everything else. This is, this is what we're doing now. I, you know, I'm, I'm 120 episodes in and I'm done with athletes. I'm, I'm all about I'm, Steve and I are now going to start a company and we're going to help everybody plan weddings. The perfect good wedding. Idea. It's good idea. Um, we'll get our wives on board. It'll just be a whole thing. You can just <laughs> sell the shoe company. Forget about shoes. This is the new direction. All makes sense to me. But I mean, it, it's, per I mean, like you said, before we got going, you invented the letter E. So, you know, e everything's a footnote after that. You know, don't tell people I invented the letter E. I'm going <laughs> to, someone's going to sue me for cultural appropriation. You don't have the patent on letter E? Yeah, they didn't have patents when I did that. Oh. Yeah. Because I was just thinking you'd be getting like lots and lots of royalties from every time the, the word, the, anything with E is in it. Uh, yeah, it was just a flat payment of $4.28. <sighs> That's, uh, a very I Colorado esque, I, I suppose. Know. It was in, not 420, 428. <laughs> I don't know why I even came up with that number. I started with four dollars, and I realized I needed to add something to it, and I waited till my brain came up with some words, and then I said 28. The, okay, okay, I I missed it. Um, so I guess I have to ask, why is it um, that you seem to skip all over the place and do really well at all of the things that you do? I mean, so we I mean oh. we start. I'm sure things started before Disc Doctors, but it, you know if if you if you're on YouTube, go, go check it out. Uh, even if you don't care anything about, uh, I'll say '90s era computers, you'll still yeah, probably right. enjoy yourself. Um, <clears throat> it was a fun time. Um, I so Disc Doctors for people who aren't going to watch, and God knows there's no reason. Uh, it's sort of like car talk, but it goes computers and it's on TV. So it was, I was the PC guy. My partner Todd was the Mac guy. We had a lot of fun, <clears throat> won a regional Emmy. We were famous in other countries where they only had two television stations and one was ours. And um, so I don't have an answer to your question because I've just been really lucky that I, for pretty much my entire life, I've been able to just do the things that I found interesting and find a way to make a living doing them. And it never occurred to me to, I've never thought about getting a job or applying. I, I think I'm going to apply for a job just to see what it's like. Cause I've never done that. And then of course I'm going to try and mess with the guy who's interviewing me cause I don't need the job. So, right. um, so yeah, I've just been, it, it, for whatever reason, I mean, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My dad was a dentist, his father, actually, I don't even know what his dad did, but my mom was a consultant and started businesses. Her dad owned a jewelry shop. Um, her grandfather did something. So it was kind of, you know, in the DNA in a way. Um, but it literally, it was never a conversation, never occurred to me. In fact, my father always wanted me to get a job. He thought that would be a good thing. I just didn't think that was worth my time. Well, it's it just the whole develop. I mean, this is where I go and I talk about stalking people. Um, <laughs> and now the truth comes out. The truth. No, it, I mean, the podcast itself gives me a, a view into people's lives, right? And I, I get the, the ability to like poke at you and ask questions I wouldn't get to otherwise. I, I have an undergrad degree, uh, one of them in psychology, uh, yeah, the too. other ones in math, which why I don't know. Same thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested in people like people are weird and, and, and we take different paths and, you know, it's it's a good thing. I, I resent the implication, but all right, I'll, I'll, I, let, I mean, I'll let it slide. You're the self-described aging hippie that lives in Boulder. So, 
Yeah, I said that as a joke because I'm I'm like so not hippie-ish other than the long hair. Um, it's and the fact that I was living in Boulder. Um, so people always assume that. Oh and, yeah, but it's it couldn't couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, I, I at least when I was in Boulder and I, I was only there for a week, so I you know that's the smallest glance you could probably get. I don't know that I would take Boulder in particular as a bunch of hippies. I would take it as like more affluent well-to-do health conscious than hippies uh but... there's both suffice it to say i have brunch with friends in this park in boulder every sunday morning and that we move to a different area of the park and in this area of the park there'll be our group having brunch anywhere between six and ten people and then next to us is someone doing intuitive medical healing and okay. next to us was someone doing yoga and next to us was dumbing someone doing tai chi and next to us was this woman just doing some weird dancey thing that looked like she was high on something and next to that was um a white guy dressed he's like a sikh who had a big gong behind him and six uh, very attractive women who were his acolytes and then next to, i mean i could keep going literally oh i forgot the guy on the the white guy again because boulder is very diverse every different kind of white person uh really really rich right, right. white people semi-rich white people medium rich white people and uh and then more actual africans than african americans uh because of the music scene ironically um so yeah boulder has its it's crazy. It's got its serious new age hippie side and then more engineering and math PhDs per capita than anywhere else. Uh, so, and aerospace engineers as well. I mean, it's a really interesting dichotomy mm -hmm. between the, uh, the left and the, I don't know what you would call the science world. So were you there prior to the shoes or did the shoes? Help yeah, no, I moved there? to Boulder 28 years ago, uh, okay. in 93 and I was, that's when I had a software company and then from like, uh, when was it from roughly 2000 to 2009, my wife and I were effectively retired. And then we started zero shoes in 2009, sort of by accident, frankly. Yeah. Well, that's what I was kind of reading on the, the, uh, like the origin story about being like, eh, yeah, I don't know about this. And, um, I, I do want to give you a, a little bit of a hard time oh, considering please. your technology background that your website crashed when you had the traffic from shark tank. Uh, only because no one gave us the idea. Well, there was two things. One, no one gave us the hint that we would see 270,000 concurrent visitors, but more importantly, <laughs> there was one plugin in the, uh, so in the e-commerce software we were using that was the thing that crashed it. Uh. And because they had never seen that kind of volume before. So we had to rewrite the thing. Cause even after we showed them what happened, they were clueless. So, um, we're, we're one of the power users for WooCommerce and we've figured out things that no one else had to figure out because of things like a sudden influx of you know over two hundred thousand visitors, and that's what I was like. I, I use Woo on the Soulfree website, and that's what I was kind of. I was like, were you using Woo at the time, or we, we had just, just switched? We had just switched a couple months before we aired on Shark Tank, uh, and yet yeah, no one had beaten it up like that before. Was it? Now we, we're going down a tangent, but this is like a, a, a personal interest, I guess. So sorry to the listener. Was it like a, an additional plugin you had had or was it like yeah. Woo itself? No, no, no. It was the plugin. It was the bundled product plugin. Because oh, okay. at the time we were on Shark Tank, we were just selling a do-it-yourself sandal making kit, which we still sell and sell quite a bit of them. They're great fun and really, really cool to develop the superpower of knowing how to make your own footwear. And so the bundled product kit plugin was the thing that crashed. It just couldn't handle that kind of volume. Okay. But I mean, on the upside, you're the guy, or if you aren't the guy, you definitely know the guy that can figure out how to fix it. Right. I'm the guy who knows how to find the guy. I can't write a line of code to save my life, but I understand code. I've been accused of being one of the best object oriented programmers who can't write a line of code. So I understand the architecture, but I can't get in there and do the heavy lifting. Gotcha. Gotcha. It, it seems like a, kind of good place to be though where it's like you know enough to know what you don't know and who does know what it is that I, you need i know enough to work well with the people that are doing the heavy lifting and right. i know enough to come up with ideas and suggestions that may they may not have thought of because they're in the weeds and i'm taking a bigger view of things so i'm very useful in that regard um more often than not well i think that lends you to being a good entrepreneur right you know how to you know, work uh, with the people that you know, can it helps. coordinate them for stuff? Well, it helps for me, but there are other people who don't know any of this stuff, and that works for them because then they don't have to 
spend brain CPU cycles trying to figure out things that technical people are working on. So I, I called a I called a dear friend of mine a while ago who's been a serial CEO S E R I A L. And I said, I don't feel like a CEO. And he goes, yeah, you don't understand. There's different kinds of CEOs. There's operational CEOs, there's finance CEOs, there's legal CEOs, then there's product marketing CEOs. And that's what you are. And frankly, there are way fewer of them. And so once I realized that, then that's cool. And my wife is frankly the operational finance person. So that's why we're a good team and why we're, we were able to build zero shoes the way we were, is we had you know, swim lanes that we were in and we really understood you know, the others and what they were doing and why that was important. So my job was basically to think of all the cool things to do. And for years, Lena's job was to tell me that we didn't have the money to do them. <laughs> so you could do the, the fun stuff and and then she gets to come in and tell you you can't do that. She likes to say that my I have the fun job of thinking of all the cool things to that could happen, and her job is to think of everything that could go wrong. Okay. And and then the marriage together helps okay. drive you forward. Yeah, perfect. Now, ironically, it's not totally true. When it comes to marketing, I'm my job is to think of all the things that could go wrong. So when people are approaching me from a marketing perspective to say, hey, you know, we're going to do this thing and it's going to make you a million dollars. I go, yeah, um, you're probably wrong. I need to look at the risk. I need to think of everything that could happen. That could, in fact, the thing that I say to people multiple times a day is how quickly and cheaply can I find out if you have your head up your butt? And they're like, what? I go, because you don't bat a thousand, right? They go, no. I go, well, I have to assume that I'm going to be one of those cases where it's not going to work. And I have to decide if I'm willing to, A, spend the money if it's a total bust, and B, figure out the probability math to understand the possibility of it make, of it having, of it breaking even, frankly. I don't even care about the profit part. Uh, and that's how I have to figure out who I might engage with or not. And nine, more than nine times out of 10, uh, once we start doing the math at all, if they can give me any numbers, because they often can't, but if they can give me any numbers, nine times out of 10, it's, it's nothing that's going to work. And um, I can show it to them in seconds. Is this people like pitching you products for their yeah. company? No, it's people. Well, here's the perfect example. A company that does um, aff uh, affiliate based influencer marketing. They mm -hmm. find influencers are only going to get paid based on performance. Right. But then they take a fee for managing this. Right. And I said, based on your fee and the affiliate commissions, I need to make X amount of dollars to break even. And X amount of dollars, I know my math, means I need X times two and a half times the number of vis of good visitors. So can you tell me how you're going to get that number of visitors? How many influencers are you going to find? What kind of traffic are you going to generate on, you know, from your experience? What are you going to be able to deliver? They said, well, you know, we can't make any promises, but we're going to be transparent. I go, <laughs> no, I don't care about transparent. I need to get, you need to give me some idea of why you think this makes sense. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, we feel really confident. Yeah, I don't care how you feel. I need to know the numbers. Here's, I just told you how much traffic I need. So you're going to have to tell me how you're going to generate that kind of traffic. And they kept, they never could. So yeah. we said, see ya. Yeah, I, I'm with you now. I, I get some of those pitches slightly differently in that, like, uh, I have pro some of my, the company's products are on Amazon. So I'll get people saying, oh, we can manage your Amazon account yeah, and do all this. Yeah, I'm yeah. just like, why would I do that? <laughs> Well, you know, it's an interesting thing, um, just for the fun of sharing, the, our business has grown to the point that I'm starting to do things that I find morally repugnant. Um, and that is I have to spend money on things as a marketer that will never make me money. Mm -hmm. So for example, there are people who we've gotten popular enough that people are using our brand, our copyrights, our trademarks, our content to build phishing sites and steal credit card data from people. I have mm -hmm. to spend tens of thousands of dollars now to sh monitor them, shut them down, et cetera. Um, and has nothing to do with making a living. It has to do yeah. with protecting people. Um, and there's other things like that uh, that are crazy. I mean, actually, here's a funny one. Uh, we have a private equity partner, and they insist that we get cyber insurance. And I argued with them about it. I said, why? They said, well, what if you get hit with a ransomware attack? I said, we're not, we're not uh, susceptible to a ransomware attack. Everything we do is in the cloud. Well, what if you, uh, someone tra tries to take down your network? We don't have a network. That's not the way our system's set up. Well, what if someone tries to take down your website? We keep real-time backups. We'd be back up in 15 minutes. Well, uh, 
well, I don't really know about this stuff. I said, well, I do. That's why I'm telling you we don't really need it. And besides, the things that that insurance covers, I mean, we're definitely not susceptible to. And finally, they said, look, if anyone ever decides to buy your company, they're going to want to check off you have cyber insurance. I went, why didn't you just tell me that? I'm willing to spend the money for something you know, where they can check the box and feel better about us. But the rest of it is, again, intellectually vacuous. And, right. uh, and so things like that, I, as a marketer, if I'm spending money and it doesn't make me money, um, it makes me very upset. So it's sort of like when people talk about branding. We just want to give you some brand awareness. I go, yeah, branding is marketing for people who don't have the balls for tracking. Um, if I can't see the results, I can't do it because we need the money. We need to make the money so we can afford the growth that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. We've never had enough money to buy enough inventory for the following year. So you know we need to, we need to make sure things work. And most people don't um, – think that way and most people don't know their numbers well enough to assess whether they're making reasonably intelligent decisions i'm never would never say that i'm right 100 percent of the time uh, i've been i've been right and wrong in both directions wrong and made money right and lost money sorry marin down your quote oh crap i have a quote <laughs> what is uh, something like uh branding is marketing for people who don't have the balls for tracking you know that's exactly it yeah <laughs> Well, I like that. I mean, it's well, because uh, and sorry for the listener, I guess we've gotten down a, a weird marketing rabbit hole. But, um, you know, like that's how you make decisions, right? You're like, I spent this many dollars and yep. this many dollars came back out. And you can look at yep. all the metrics from therein, like, you know, click through rate impressions, blah, 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 all the steps of where people are and all that kind of stuff but just if you don't look at it you don't know what well, the problem is you just did my favorite thing it's like click through rate and impressions there's those are two things that i could care less about because those are the two easiest things to fake i can literally go buy a million impressions right for, for a hundred dollars i can buy a million clicks for a hundred dollars so uh you know the only thing that matters is really what comes out the other side which is can i see that we made sales based on this right and, and even crazier can i see that the sales came from that marketing initiative not from some other thing related to it so when people are anyway we could go down that it, it's it suffice it to say the math is it gets very complicated um, if you understand it well, and if you're a salesperson, you can hyper simplify it. And for people who are better, you know, you can keep your job, but it's, uh, you're not really providing a benefit to the universe. Well, as somebody who is um, way more versed in internet marketing than I am, I, I want to pick your brain just briefly on that right. point. And, and when I, so I mentioned click-through rate, I, I would use that personally if I'm like, as, as trying to figure out what kind of like say images or ad creatives give this is you know, my people attention this is my pause finger Go yes on. you're right you're right ish so click through rate is an interesting number it can be valuable but it's not always valuable right. so sometimes you can get a really high click through rate with really crap traffic and what right. good is it right sometimes you can get a lower click through rate but it's a it's better traffic so the click through rate is just one thing you need to look at as part of a panoply a word that i don't think i've ever used in a sentence a panoply of data that you need to look at with a more holistic perspective to get a sense of what's going on i mean perfect example a very big deal youtuber contacted me love your shoes uh, i want you to come out and do this uh conference that i'm putting on and i'm gonna have six sponsors i want you to be one of the sponsors i said cool um it's gonna cost you x number of dollars I went, not so cool uh, i need to know if i can make money with you before i can spend a bunch of money to come to your conference mm -hmm. so he got um he sent out a bunch of emails, amazing click-through rate, 26,000 unique visitors to our website in a very short period of time. We made a whopping, and that's air quotes around the word, whopping 20 sales. And I said to him, dude, if I had gotten 26,000 unique visitors through what I'm, we're already doing, we would have gotten about 1,000 sales. So clearly, your audience is nothing but, I don't know, 13-year-old boys from Bangladesh or something. Right. And um, he had no idea. And it took me a while. I kept showing him the numbers. And no one had ever done that to them before. Yeah. No one had ever tracked the results and showed them the numbers. So they were able to, to garner these very, very high fees for doing things that were completely ineffectual. Well, and I'm glad you shared that because if I get approached for stuff like that and they say, hey, you know, whatever spend money with us and we'll bring you people. and i yeah. say well like you know the people you've worked with previously like what what kind of results do they get and they say well they don't share that with us and i'm like well yeah. then how am i supposed to know right well and you know and when they say here's the flip side when they say we'll send you a case study i go don't bother 
They go, what? Right. I go, well, I, I, the only one I care about is the crappy ones. I want to see who lost and figure out why. Right. Because you're not going to send anything that's related to my business. I don't know what their goals are. Um, you're always going to send me, you know, the best looking whatever. You're going to send me things that are averages. And if you're going to give me an average, you're a math person. If you're going to give me an average, give me the maximum, the minimum, and the standard deviation. Because that's the only way right. I can determine what's useful. And I've never, I've literally never talked to anyone who was able to, who even knew what I meant when I said that. Yeah. Well, it's like, I, I'd rather in similar vein, and you're probably even more of a math person than I am, despite my degree, nah. but nah. Um, I'm like, I'm more interested like, what's the distribution? Like, okay, they have yeah. a case study of somebody that yeah. does well. It's like, okay, was that one out of a hundred clients that did that well? Or is it, is well, that 50% this is, this of is, clients that do well? Or? This is, I'm an influencer and on average, my videos got a million views. No, mm -hmm. you had one view that got a hundred million views and you have a hundred videos that got one view. <laughs> right, so, right. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. anyway, we'll get off. Uh, well, part, part of my uh, uh, shtick was going to be to ask you, how do I get you on my marketing team? Um, <laughs> you can't. So I've, I've rounded about poked your brain enough about about marketing. So we'll, we'll try to we'll try to divest ourselves right. from that right. a little bit and give uh, the listener a little bit more uh, maybe athletic meat to come back to. Um, so so, you know, you came back to sprinting of all things, which people don't typically do, at least at least that I know. Yeah. Um, you know, 30 years on from the last time you did it. Why, why did you come back to sprinting? I mean, you're in Boulder, you, there's all the trails. Why don't you go, Oh, I'm going to do an ultra like everybody else. Cause I'm a sprinter. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, people don't come, I mean, it, what I'm going to reframe what you said. It's not okay. that people don't come back to sprinting. It's that people don't become sprinters. Sprinters gotcha. come back to sprinting. Non-sprinters are not sprinters. And, um, I had this argument with Daniel Lieberman at Harvard where he said, you know, we're all persistence endurance athletes. We're all that we evolve to slowly track down our prey. And I said, not my people. And he's like, what? I said, no, I'm a sprinter. I'm not a distance runner. I can't do distance. It doesn't work. He goes, well, you just didn't train that way. I said, yeah, that's what all you slow guys say. No, we're a different breed. What I can tell you is my friends and I, we deadlift three times our body weight. Your friends can barely do a couple of push-ups. So your friends would, you know, go slowly hunt down the antelope. My friends would come pick it up, throw it over their shoulders and carry it home. So different, different energy system, different way of using your body. And actually it's not true. The form is not radically different, frankly. It's just different energy system. Like when people talk about high intensity interval training, they say things like sprint for 30 seconds, rest for 30 seconds and repeat that eight times. And I say, if you can do that more than one and a half times, you're not actually sprinting. sprinting. You may be running as fast as you can, but you're not sprinting. And finally, I said to one guy, um, you know, how far do you run in 30 seconds? And he very proudly said something like, I don't know, you know, 180 meters. I said, dude, I'm 30 years older than you. And when I go all out for 30 seconds, I go 250 meters. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, that's different. I went, yeah. So anyway, so I got back, got back into sprinting. I took a break because I, I everyone got taller than I was in high school. Our, our track coach was a, um, not a sprinting coach, didn't understand sprinters. So I became a pole vaulter and long jumper. Then I was an all American gymnast at that same time. And then occasionally people tried to get me to run, which I do a half a mile and like, I, I'm done. Uh, and then one day a friend of mine came into brunch and said he just won his first 5k. He was really proud. And I said, yeah, I love the idea of running, but I was always a sprinter. He goes, you know, there's a whole master's track and field circuit. It has all the events. And I went, what? And so you know, <laughs> that's how it all began. That's kind of what I'm waiting for at this point. So I'm, I'm 32 now and I'm like, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not anywhere fast enough to be like professional runner. And I'm a distance runner. So that's what I did in college. So I'm like, I just need to wait a couple decades <laughs> and then this and is then always the plan. You right, know, I can start doing No, you're masters. here's the, here's the problem. There's a lot of guys who are having that same thought. Oh and yeah. There's also a lot of guys who continued through the age that you are and are going to going to continue. So the guys who are faster than me, most of them are former nationally ranked professional athletes and things and uh, it's a whole different game. Uh, when I, I will confess, when I first got back into sprinting, I did have the fantasy of winning races. And I do win most of the races that I'm in, in my age group, um, and often an age group or two below mine as well. But um, when it gets to like nationals and international meets, my only goal there is to like make it to a quarterfinal 
or be in a relay at the end of the thing. At, at regional meets or even some national meets, my goal is to show up at the starting line and as the five foot four inch white Jew, have people look at me and go, what the hell is he doing here? And then <laughs> beat most of the guys that I'm racing because I'm not going to beat all of them at a national meet and have them go, what just happened? And um, happily, that's kind of, you know, the effect that I generate um, is it's a little surprising, apparently. But um, but there, guys, I mean, I used to claim that I was potentially the fastest Jew over 55 in the world. And then I met a guy who's three years older than me, who's actually just one of the fastest guys in the world. And he so I'm, I like to say now I'm I think I'm the second fastest, which actually makes me seem a little more humble. <laughs> um, but um, this guy's a freak. I mean, like his third he got back into sprinting at 39. And I think his second or his third time running, not his third race, I think his third time running, he set a national record. I mean, just, you know, sprinting is 99% genetics and 1% mm -hmm. maximizing your genetics. Yeah. That's what, um, when I was getting to triathlon uh, post-college, I was speaking with the uh, collegiate swim coach at the college I went to. And he was like, I love training the endurance swimmers because he was like, the sprinters, like you either have it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, there's much more I can do as a coach with the endurance athletes and building yeah. them up than I can with the sprinters where like they can get better. But if you're not built to do it, you're not built to do it. There are very, the, you know, the only instance I can think of of a internationally ranked sprinter who was not the fastest kid that people knew growing up is Ben Johnson. At 15, he was not a great sprinter. I mean, he was okay, apparently. Charlie Francis, his coach, thought there was something there. Um, and between training and performance-enhancing drugs that everybody was taking then, uh, he became internationally ranked sprinter. But um, he, but literally, I can't think of another story. When I someone a asked on a panel discussion, a high school track coach, they said, you know, how do you identify like the people you want to bring into your sprinting program when they're in high school? He goes, I don't. I look at them in fifth grade and I find the fastest kid in school. Makes it simple. Well, it's just that's the way it is. I mean, the only even in high school, the only guys who beat me in high school were my closest friends who were the fastest guy from a different elementary school. Gotcha. So did you you said you did um, pole vault and long jump, long jump. Yeah. Did you actually enjoy those or was it just oh, yeah, like forced them. to do it? Okay. Love them. So long jump because it's basically sprinting and then you just jump. And right. then pole vault, it's basically sprinting and then you do gymnastics. So no, I, they were, I, I, I was still doing both as a master's athlete, but I also have a broken spine. And so when I discovered that, my doctors went, can you please stop pole vaulting and long jumping? And we're not even sure about the sprinting. I said, I will give you pole vaulting and long jumping. In fact, I didn't even say that. I got out of the pit after landing in a long jump and um, my legs were vibrating. And I realized that was because I just jammed my sciatic nerve by compressing my spine. So I went, all right, I'll stop that one. Pole vaulting, it made sense to stop, um, <laughs> and sprinting, they, they can't convince me to stop. Well, with the pole vaulting, you know, it's there is obviously some inherent risk in launching yourself high oh, into the air. Yes, only of death. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess, I guess if you come at, come down and you die, you're not going to know any different. So here's 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 what pole vaulting is like. Pole vaulting is like running as fast as you can into a wall. That's the mentality you have to have is I'm willing to run as fast as I can and then hit a wall and then be nimble enough to not slam into it. But but basically, that's the gist. Like there's a guy here in town uh, named Pat Manson and Pat was an Olympic pole vaulter. He I think he, he jumped over 17, maybe even over, over 18. I can't remember. Uh, I think over 18 feet like every year from the time he was I'm making this up 18 to 35 or something. I mean, crazy long career and watching Pat approach the 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 box his last th he accelerates in the last four steps before he plants and when you watch that it feels like it's insane it feels like this guy is accelerating as he's about to hit the wall what's he doing and and then standing under the bar when he's jumping 17 6 18 feet your brain just goes that is not possible and then of course you watch guys who do 18 20 feet and it's even it seems even less 
can I mean, you can't even conceive it. Your brain, the only thing that made less sense to me that I saw it in real time, I was in Berlin when Usain Bolt set the world record. I was like five rows off the track at the 70 meter mark mm -hmm. and watching someone run by you at just shy of 30 miles an hour, fast enough to get a speeding ticket in my neighborhood. Your brain just goes, what? It just doesn't <laughs> seem real. Yeah. I think that the, if, so if you, the listener, have never seen pole vault in person, you must. That, the, the, well, right. You have to because the, the trick is like you can watch it on TV at the Olympics, but like it's not the same as I'm going to sit next to the mats or, you know, yeah. or right next to where the bar is and watching them go up, seeing the pole bend, like seeing the whole thing in yeah. in real time. It's just not the same thing. No, track doesn't commute. Track doesn't translate to TV very well. And most sports don't. You know, one of the most exciting sports I've ever seen in my life in real time that is couldn't be more boring on TV. Olympic Olympic lifting. In real time, the adrenaline is so high, it's like contagious. It is so exciting and just so terrifying, especially in the lower weight classes where you're watching guys, you know, lift three times their body weight. I mean, just like some crazy numbers. And it was I mean, I, I get chills thinking about it. It's one of the most exciting things I ever saw live, but you can't go to like the Olympics and see it or even some national meets because you're too far away. You got to go to a regional meet where you're like right up against the stage mm -hmm. and it is, oh man, it's the best. Oh, I, I, you know, I haven't, I, I've, I don't know that I've seen any of that gotta in go. person. Gotta I, go. I don't know that I have. I can, I can imagine it. I lucked out when uh, when they had the Atlanta Olympics um, were in Colorado. Of course, the Olympic Training Center is in Colorado Springs. Right. So they had most of the qualifying meets around Colorado. So I just went to everything I could think of that I had never seen before. Um, I went to Taekwondo and Greco-Roman wrestling and, and, and wrestling is super fun to go to because the people in the stands, they're either all wrestlers, ex-wrestlers or family of wrestlers or ex-wrestlers. There's like no one there who's just casually interested and they all know each other. They all grew up together. So mm -hmm. it's this big familial thing. If they could have a barbecue, they would have a barbecue right there, you know, in the, in the stadium. Um, and like when I, when I watched uh, wrestling at the Olympics, there was this one Polish wrestler who was just doing really well. And so, and everyone knew him, you know, they didn't expect him to do that well. And when they saw how well he was doing, everybody became his biggest fan. Everyone's just screaming, Polska, Polska. I mean, people who would otherwise be against him, they were just so happy for him. I mean, oh man, it was awesome. Uh, there's gotta be, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, if, like distance running is kind of like that, but I think there's, like probably proportionally way more people that do it. So you probably lose some of that. I think you probably still get a little bit of that when you start going um, trail and ultra where it's like very it's few the, people showing up. But it's not the same as a sport that's as self-contained right. as something, you know, like wrestling. And right. here's another one that people have probably never been to that is I went to because it happened to be in Boulder and I thought I got to go check this out. I went to the Northern Colorado Amateur Bodybuilding Competition. Okay. Now, um, some of these amateurs were really good. Mm -hmm. and But the reason for being there, or the, the thing that shocked me about it, was it was the most supportive, loving environment I've ever been in in my life. Because there was a bunch of people on that stage who clearly weren't ready to be there. Either they hadn't gotten to the point where they should have been there, or they didn't didn't lean down enough, whatever it was. But the important part was that everybody in that audience at some point had been that person. And so they were so supportive. They were so kind. Um, it was, I mean, it, it's just wonderful. And then at the end, they bring out a guy who's a professional bodybuilder, who's three times the size of the guys that you just saw. And he'll come out and do some guest posing, like, you know, run out into the audience. And everyone is keeping a respectful distance as they're taking photos. And I am not that guy. I'm like, you know, an inch away going, what the hell? It looks like someone took a cow apart and put it back together inside your skin. I mean, to stand next to someone who was, this is a guy named Jay Cutler. He's like 5'8", five, 5'9", five, weighed in the off season. He weighed about almost 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. Guys, barely taller than I am. Three, twice my weight. And to see someone, to see, I mean, I, whether you like it or not is not the important part. It's just literally amazing to see. It's It's something that, it's so rare that it was just fascinating, totally fascinating. But the supportive part was just 
um, just utterly delightful. Got to go. Got to go. I'm not sure what to follow that up with. <laughs> well, it was nice talking to you. So, anyway, these are, but you know, I, I guess what I'm making a, what I'm making a play for is whenever you get a chance, find a sport where they're having some kind of you know decently uh, competitive event, not mm -hmm. just like a high school thing necessarily. People where you, where you're going to see people who are really good that you've never gone to before, mm -hmm. and just go see it live and try to get the best seat you can because you will be shocked, I would argue, at finding things that you never imagined in a million years will be super, super exciting, super interesting. You may never follow them again. You're not going to attract the athletes. But when the event comes, you'll go because you know there's something very special going on. And when we're in our own little private Idaho about the thing that we do, I think you miss out on some of those things. And track meets are funny that way because I call track meets attention deficit disorder theater because there's all so many things going on at one time. Right. And you're usually watching the thing that you know and you like, but right. it's going to be the other thing that's really cool. Like at the World Masters Track and Field Championships, I, I, I competed there in Finland about 13 years ago. The most exciting thing was uh, a guy who uh, threw the shot put. It's not technically throwing, but anyway, put the shot right. about 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Why is that exciting? Because he was 101. And everybody was glued to this guy because everyone in that audience is thinking, I want to be that guy. Yeah. I want to be 101. I want to be out here doing this. I don't care how good it is. I just want to be out here. And it was the best. That's, you know, that's funny. That's what I was going to say is like, obviously, I can watch the distance events and like see what's going on, the little things and the moves and all that kind of stuff. But like when I would be done with my event, I would go hang out with the throwers. The I'm, throwers I'm are interested. amazing. I, yeah. I, I like disc. Um, Hammer is always interesting to me. Hammer's insane. <laughs> I mean, I remember watching a hammer thrower when I was a kid um, and just thinking that was crazy. But then, you know, we have one of the top hammer throwers in the world here in Colorado. Watching that, I mean, it is, it just doesn't, I mean, it is flat out nuts. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know what? It looks like someone just got electrocuted and then they throw a 16 pound ball 200 feet. I mean, just, it is crazy. Yeah. Well, and like the, just the perspective, it's again another thing where like you can watch it on TV, but the perspective is, is like if you don't have a bearing in having watched it live, you don't really get how freaking far that thing's flying. They just, there's another part though. When you're watching it live, there's always this thing in the back of your head like that thing's going to hit me. You know, yes. This, this could go off the rails at any moment. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, that's exactly what my wife said when we were watching it. We were watching Hammer. And, you know, there's a people out measuring and they're standing yeah. in the field as it's coming at them. She was like, aren't they afraid it's going to hit them? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, maybe, but maybe. I, I think there's probably some cognitive dissonance where it's like, it's not going to hit me. No, but I mean, but hammer, hammer, even more than any of the others, you watch that and literally you think this could, this could get very bad, very fast. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the excitement of it. I, I think I think about that probably more with javelin because there are like the you can look yeah. up YouTube examples of notable javelin <laughs> situations that have gone wrong. Yeah. Um, and because it is basically a weapon. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, they're all weapons, but it, it, because I think the, the sharp pointy part makes it a, a little more like <laughs> <laughs> imaginatively visceral. Like, yeah, the heavy bally part can do more damage, but the sharp pointy point part makes, you know, makes more sense. I, I, I don't know if it's a matter of just like uh, most of us have never been bludgeoned with something, but we've cut <laughs> ourselves. Right. Yeah. So I think that, I think, I don't know if that's it. Like if that's like, well, it's sharp. So I know sharp is bad, but I've let's never been say, like hit up. So, by, by like let's say during the civil war, people were more uptight about hammer throw than they were about javelin. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> more, more flying balls of steel then. But we're so divorced from that. You know, it's just, now it's just this entertainment. It's Oh, Look at them throwing the ball. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point. A lot of these things did evolve out of stuff that we used to do to survive. Right. Or kill each other. Which, Same thing. Which is the... Okay. <laughs> it's, it's sometimes, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's like um, I had uh, briefly entertained, you know, because I was not good enough to be a professional runner. And I was like, I want to continue on with athletics after college. I ended up going with triathlon, trying to be a pro in that. But... I briefly entertained the idea of trying to get into modern pentathlon. Mm, and I, I told my wife about this, I don't know, during the Olympics, and she because she didn't know. And she was like, well, what is that? And I told her, 
Uh, and so for those that don't know modern pentathlon, there's uh, horseback riding, pistol shooting, fencing, running and swimming. Um, and she's like, well, like, how do you get this amalgamation of events? Well, it's like it's it's where as decathlon supposed to be like a Grecian soldier, the skills of a Grecian soldier, then modern pentathlon is supposed to be like a 19th century, like horseback yeah. kind of soldiery person. So it's it's all warfare related ad- adaptations of skills well, here's here's a sport that is also um uh, the t- or the t- two sports that are also really exciting to watch in a way that makes no sense whatsoever and that's archery and target shooting and they're exciting to watch because you're just waiting to see you know are they going to do it i mean it's like it, it, we know what has to happen is it going to happen or not and i have a weird fantasy I, um so i my mind is not um how do i want to put it Focus is not my thing per se. I mean, going broad and seeing lots of possibilities is my thing. But physically, I'm into the precision things. Mm-hmm. Sprinting is a precision sport. I was into target shooting as a kid, archery and riflery. Um, bowling, golf, I mean, any of those things that are precision is what I really like. I, there's, um, I can go to sniper school. I have no interest in being a sniper. But the, the, what you have to do to be able to, to reliably hit a target a mile and a half away is utterly fascinating mm-hmm. and um uh i, I want to try that well maybe we'll have to have you back on after you've gone and you tell us about the experience and <laughs> everything that happened i think i think some of this came from living in a house that was on open space and there was a trail about a half a mile out and i just kept thinking i could pick those people off i, I could get them <laughs> with a, i could get them with a paintball nobody would know <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a good note to end on no, I, I do. We are running short on time, so hey. I, I I have a question I ask everybody, um, or at least I have a new question every season. So this season's question is: uh, How do you stay motivated after failing to reach a goal? Uh, isn't that enough motivation? Maybe I mean, ser- seriously, like if I, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't set goals to begin with per se. That's just not doesn't make sense to me in most contexts. But if I'm trying to do something and it doesn't work, that's usually motivation enough. Um, sprinting is an interesting one, for example, because you can't do it perfectly. Right. So at the end of at the end of a race, someone says, "How'd you do?" And my answer is, "Do you just want a number, or am I supposed to give you the excuse?" Because there's always something wrong that happened. You mm-hmm. can't do it right. And the intermittent reinforcementness of it mm-hmm. is self-motivating it's what makes it actually fun and addicting to do it's why i can't do it just without competition i need to have the competition because otherwise what's the point and the competition is a it's not a goal it's just something to uh um work towards if you will and then it'll do what it does and away you go and if it doesn't go well there's literally the intrinsic effect of intermittent reinforcement it's like ah oh, damn it if i could only have done that thing right and so literally you don't have to do anything to motivate yourself other than be willing to try and you know get a little better next time it's ironically i did stand up comedy for a living and it's in in a weird way not too dissimilar from that because it, in the early stages you have good sets and bad sets and then eventually it evens out and you get better and then there are these anomalous moments that are really good or really bad and once you have a once you're basically competent which means you don't blame the audience when a joke doesn't work. You can tell the difference between something funny and something not. Um, then, you know, it, it, the, it, it's in, it, for me at least, it's intrinsically motivating. It's not, I don't need to do a thing. Um, I would argue that if you need to do a thing, then you're not doing the right thing. You're not, your attention's in the wrong place. If it's not, if it doesn't just make you just get out of bed going, God, I gotta, ugh, Jesus, you know, then something is awry. If you feel like, like you need to psych yourself up for something, um, I mean, there's times you need to psych yourself up for the thing you're going to do. But if you need to psych yourself up even for the training of it, for example, uh, you know, find find a, find another hobby. Uh, actually, here's a weird one um, for sprinting. One of the things that's been and almost anything I've done. One of the things that's really helpful. I can't say that it's something that I use as a motivation motivating technique, but it's part of the process is my partners, my training partners. I mean, we are, uh, we, we love each other dearly. We've been doing this now for, 
I don't know, 13, 14 years. Um, and even when it was less, you know, we loved each other dearly. We support each other. Sometimes, you know, one will call the other and say, which track are we going to use today? And when we get there, the other one says, I'm so glad you called because I was ready to sleep in. And it's not because we're not motivated. It's just because, you know, sometimes you feel the urge to sleep in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes 20 minutes of warming up to you realize, oh, actually, I did want to do this this morning. Mm -hmm. I just needed to get over a little hump. But so the social thing is part of what makes it work, if you will. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid, when I was a gymnast, uh, I wrote a, I started writing a book with a friend of mine that was about how to get in shape, basically how to lift weights, how to get stronger. And the first chapter was find a partner because it's just, there's some days you just don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's some times where that's good to listen to and take a time, take time off. And there's some times where you just need a reason to just get rolling. Um, this is going to sound really weird, somewhat tangential. So we just moved into this new house and I've got a home gym that I put together in the basement where is where we also have a little media room. Um, I would never have made a media room. It came with the house. I'm embarrassed by that, but that's where the, that's where the TV is. And so the point of that is, uh, it's also the way to get out of the house to get to the hot tub that's outside. So I have to walk through my home gym multiple times per day. Every time I walk through, I do something. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily do a concerted workout or a concentrated workout, but every day I do some things and that's works for me better than I'm going to set aside 40 minutes, three times a week or whatever it is. Um, the organic thing is really helpful. So I guess that's another answer to your question is, um, whenever possible, just put the thing that you need to do in the way so you can't ignore it. That doesn't mean you're going to do it right away. You might look at it and go, ah, crap and walk by it, but eventually you're going to go, yeah, shit, may as well just do it. It's a very uh, complex yet well thought out answer. So I, I really appreciate that. Most people um, say things like, you know, do affirmations and do blah, blah, blah. I actually but, don't get that very often, oh, surprisingly. What do most people say? Um, some people, it's just uh, it's kind of common this year has been like, um, I just set another goal or like, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. I try again. Um, yeah. Most of the people that I have on the show don't view failure as like, this life ending oh it's it's, a, it's such a thing because they've gone through it so many times that it's yeah. like it's just yeah. another step of the process to Some get days, to where i want to you know, go here's I, i'm gonna i'll sort of leave this topic on this thought i've uh i've talked to a number of olympians um about this and usually because it comes up in a conversation where someone asks them how do you get in the zone Mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay. Uh, what, or they ask something about, you know, what do you do for your mental preparation or your psychological whatever? And they'll, they'll go on for 20 minutes. And then I say, do you ever have a personal best when you felt like shit? They said, yeah. Do you ever like set a world record when you felt like you couldn't even get out of bed? They go, yeah. I go, well, there goes that sports psychology bullshit. So sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Right. And clearly what you're thinking has nothing to do with it. Humans love to try to reverse engineer what we call success, you know, yeah. getting to a goal, but you can't. Some days, you know, the stars line up and you happen to be the one. It's I like the, the analogy I like is you happen to be the guy standing under the building when someone yelled baby and you just put out your arms and the baby landed in your arms. And sometimes, you know, you could do everything you can to try to catch that baby and it's going to splat. And um, we love to try to figure out how to be the guy who catches the baby more often. You just can't do it. I mean, there's a reason they talk about football and say any given Sunday. It's true for everything. Mm -hmm. um, there are some times where the odds are stacked in your – like I've said to some of these Olympians after they went through the whole thing about how they mentally prepared and got in the zone. I went, yeah, here's a crazy one for you. You were the best in the world at that time. And they're like, no. I said, when I was an All-American gymnast, I didn't have to do anything to get psyched up. I just happened to be the best in that area that I was competing in at that time for uh, innumerable factors that were out of my control. My grandfather was a gymnast, which I didn't know till I was in my forties. My junior high school gym teacher was a three time, five time national, three time world tumbling champion. And one of the greatest teachers of all sorts, um, who just happened to be able to teach to what you did. Uh, I mean, there was just so many factors that had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. Plus the factors that had to do with me had nothing to do with me, genetics and, you know, crazy, whatever, right. like the 10,000, sorry, last thought. Like people get into this whole 10,000 hour rule thing. And I say, first of all, that's nonsense because no gymnast or sprinter has ever been able to put in 10,000 hours. But more importantly, what makes you the kind of person who wants to put in 10,000 hours? You can't fake that. You can't do that artificially. Right. 
that's either there or not. And if it's there, you're probably one of those people who, if you put in 10,000 hours, if that's a, an activity that allows it, where you're going to end up pretty damn good. Yeah. Anyway. Before we sign off, where can uh, people get the shoes? Maybe see your stand-up comedy. Is that recorded anywhere? No, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm at zero shoes, X E R O shoes dot com, or at zero shoes or slash zero shoes on social media, wherever you happen to at or slash. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Stephen. Pleasure, man.